Man, we are live. Oh, and by the way, I will not be at the hearing at 10 a.m., but I I would urge, with, given that we've got to have the um, House institutions and House judiciary, <clears throat> as well as somebody from House Appropriations who um, does corrections for the House Appropriations Committee. Um, we really, you really w do need to hear the entire report. And so if people start breaking in, um, other than clarification, um, it's going to be a long morning. Um, so I, I, and again, I, I won't be there. I'm going to, um, I think it's better if Philip thinks our committee. And it is our committee running the show. They're all invited guests. Okay. Um, so we're going to... You, you feel free to call them whenever you'd like. <laughs> okay. So uh, we already heard a piece of the report, but we'll hear right. it again. We've, we've gone over the probation piece. Yeah. They have not. But I think um, there are other sections of it, particularly the behavioral health, um, that are going to need legislation. And hopefully Bryn is there to keep... And already is aware of that. But a, a number of the provisions of the rest of the report deal with behavioral health and issues of behavioral health with um, corrections and particularly in the corrections field as people leave and they're not getting <clears throat> the treatment they need either for substance abuse or um, mental health. Sound familiar, Commissioner Brown? Yes, yes. I don't think there's any difference in terms of that issue between the juvenile and the adult system. We're, we're woefully inadequate in providing services in the community for many of these youngsters. Yeah, we're looking forward to our conversation, a roundtable conversation on fr on Friday morning with yeah. with your committee and the House Human Services Committee as well. Yeah, yeah they. Uh, but this morning we're talking about firearms, and it dawned on me and. The, think other members of the committee that this bill would um, uh, prohibit uh, firearms in child care facilities. And we had heard from people diametrically opposed on the, on the core, on the, on the office buildings, on hospitals, et cetera. We heard people all in favor of the hospitals. We hadn't heard a peep out of the on child care, so I thought it would be a good idea to hear from you and your thoughts on this bill. And if it would complicate your job any or would it make it easier? I know licensing for foster parents, you can't have a gun in the home. And I just, um, I've been through that license. I don't know if you have those similar rules on the child care. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Senator. Um, for the record, uh, Sean Brown, Commissioner for the Department for Children and Families. And with me today, um, I have our general counsel, Jennifer Micah, as well. And hopefully we can um, walk you through um, our regulated child care system. Um, one of our divisions in uh, the Department for Children and Families is the Child Development Division. And a part of their function is to um, is to oversee and regulate um, you know, the child care system. That includes center-based care programs, as well as registered and family care homes. And as part of that work regulating that, you know, one of the primary concerns is the health and safety of the children in those programs. And as a part of that, we have promulgated regulations that touch on a wide variety of safety issues for the providers to, to make sure that we're providing a safe learning environment for our children, whether that that's on uh, Play, playground equipment, fencing, you know, uh, how the program inside is laid out and hazards there. And also a piece of that, um, our regulations do touch on um, weapons. And so, and they break into two components and we provided those to the committee this morning by email, the, the subsections of our regulations um, that touch on uh, weapons in, in center-based programs and registered in family childcare homes as well. And so our regulations have gone through the APA process um, and they're in effect and, you know, and our teams work with providers 
across the state to make sure they're complied with and provide technical assistance and education across the board would uh, to help providers implement. And then sometimes we have funding available to help them implement um, those regulations as well. Um, given our, many of our child programs operate on a very thin margin. Um, and as a part of that, so our rules break out in, into two sections. Uh, there's the center-based programs, and I'll just uh, read for you the, the regulation for center-based programs. Um, it, uh, the licensees shall ensure no firearms and other weapons, including hunting knives, archery equipment, and weapon accessories such as ammunition are present at the center-based child care program. And so th that regulation touches on um, our center-based programs, our larger programs. And then our registered and family child care home regulations say that uh, the registered and family child care home provider shall ensure all firearms and other weapons, including but not limited to hunting knives, archery equi equipment, and weapons such as ammunition are locked in the facility and that ammunition is locked and stored in a separate uh, area. Um, and so the, um, you know, those are the regulations that are currently in place. Um, we've not had any issues um, to our teams. You know, we've inquired um, to see if there's been any concerns or issues and, uh, um, and to our team's memory, we've not had any issues or concerns in general. Um, with these rules or um, issues with firearms or other weapons at either center-based programs or registered and family care uh, programs. Uh, one of our uh, areas that we've identified uh, where it might conflict with S30 and our regulations are, as you can see, our regulations are a bit more broad in scope um, than S30 um, it, uh, in terms of that we uh, you know, uh, touch on other weapons as well, like hunting knives, yep. archery equipment, and reference ammunition. Um, S30 is pretty general and just touches on firearms. Um, and these regulations were promulgated in an environment where there was no um, statutory guidance or, or uh, laws on the books that would implicate um, our regulations. And if S30 passed in its current form, um, it could implicate our rules and possibly require us to go back through the rulemaking because now there would be a statute in place. Um, and then and it could also restrict our ability to, to regulate in the way we have here, particularly around the other weapons and ammunition, just given this bill doesn't touch on that. And so it could really complicate our ability to continue to regulate in the way we have and the relationships we've established with our providers who are used to these rules and working within these rules. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, Senator Bruce. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I'm wondering, as I I didn't have it in front of me, but I thought it, th what you read said that the center shall ensure that there are no weapons on the premises. Um, how uh, how is that envisioned? How how do they ensure that they that there are not weapons. So they're center-based, so they're not homes. And so we yep. um, have teams of licensors that go out and do inspections um, when, when licenses are due and um, when changes are made. And, and they walk through and just make sure that they have policies in place uh, that address this and that they're following those policies. Um, as I indicated before, we've not had any issues with the implementation of these regs or the enforcement of these regs um, up, um, up until this point. Well, I, I uh, understand that. I'm imagining a scenario where somebody comes in uh, with a firearm on them. Um, those rules don't empower the center to remove the person as I see it. They just require that the center ensure that the weapon not be there. So if a parent or someone else stood on their purported constitutional right to carry their weapon openly. We are an open carry state. Um, how, how would that, uh, what, what authority would that center stand on? So that, that uh, center could take um, preventative measures in terms of signage and educating parents about um, not uh, bringing firearms into the center. If um, a parent chose to continue that practice, um, you know, that they have a constitutional right um, to bear arms, but they don't have a constitutional right to access that center. 
and ultimately the center could um, ask that family to move to a new provider or seek alternate childcare arrangements if, if they're not willing to comply um, with, with our regulations in terms of uh, no weapons in the facility. Okay, thank you. But, um, uh, oh, mm, sorry. No, as a follow-up on you, and I, and I think this is true of my hospital as well, and it may be true of the courts. You're not allowed to bring any weapons. It doesn't matter whether it's firearms or, because um, I, I know that in the courthouses, um, they've collected an amazing amount of weapons and from knives to brass knuckles to all kinds of, it was an amazing, you know, I went over it one day and saw what they had collected in a two or three month period at the various courthouses and over at the Supreme Court. And the Chief Justice was, you know, I was, I was just surprised. Well, very little of it was firearms. Most of it was other forms of weapons. So you're saying base basically no weapons in child care facilities. That, that's the. So you're similar to um, most hospitals. The sign says no fire, no weapons, firearms or other weapons. State House, I believe, just says no weapons. I know firearms. Correct. We, 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 our rules are a little bit more broad than just firearms. We touch on all oh, that's of that. That's how S30, if we left S30 the way it is and it passed, it, I can see how it would cause a complication for you. Correct. That's one of our concerns. And I think the other concern touching on um, Senator Bruce, um, a question just expanding on that. Um, while we've never had an issue with that, um, you know, our parents are dropping and picking up kids pretty regularly from, you know, center-based programs and other programs. And, you know, and just the way you live your, Vermonters live their lives, we would be concerned that um, if under S30, that um, many of our parents, you know, who might um, uh, hunt or, or carry firearms for other purposes um, could be in violation of S30, just dropping off and picking up with no intent um, other than just delivering their child to a, or picking their child up from a, a, a provider. Um, by the way, the, the regulations are posted on our website. Uh, and if I might. Yeah, go ahead. I'm so, I'm so, I so, broke into you. That's all right. Um, we, we had been discussing uh, removing the property or the grounds from the bill. So it would just be the building. Um, but I wanted to ask you on a different tack. You're, you're an interesting witness from two avenues on this bill because the bill yeah, also covers government buildings. Um, and DCF was the workplace of Laura Sobel, um, who was killed uh, by a, a, an irate and deranged uh, person. So I'm wondering... Um, my sense is that the uh, leadership uh, in the administration of the agencies is of one mind on this bill. I'm wondering, I know there have been movements among state employees, especially following Laura Sobel's death to um, provide greater safety and security. Do you have a sense of where they would be on this bill? Yeah, I think, you know, we w have worked very closely with our staff um, and continue to do um, sa uh, sa a culture of safety is, is, is crucial, particularly in certain areas of our work, um, uh, you know, where we interact uh, regularly um, with the public, uh, particularly for our staff who might be out um, meeting in the community with different members. Um, and so, you know, we have developed protocols to keep uh, staff safe. Um, and so it, it is a complicated mix because we have staff that um, are, are working in the community regularly, which, you know, a bill like S30 really wouldn't um, address that. And then in many of our other staff work in facilities where we have um, full-time security and screening in place um, and, you know, and are we ask people to keep their bags in the lobby if, if, if there's like, um, uh, y you know, uh, weapons or whatnot. And, it, and it's a very complicated um, uh, mix of, of, you know, of how we address that, um, you know, in some of our programs, we serve 
um, homeless Vermonters who carry their possessions with them wherever they go. Um, and some of them camp regularly, depending on the time of the year. And many of them, um, uh, you know, have, um, you know, you, you know, uh, like axes or machetes that they use to help create campsites and, and sometimes for self-protection. Um, and so, you know, we, we try to be careful and balance the, the, you know, the interest in making sure people have access to our, ser our services, but also make sure our staff are safe. And so, um, you know, it's complicated. I, I, I appreciate the answer. I don't think it necessarily responded to my question. Um, yeah. Do it, do you have a sense of how DCF workers um, might feel about uh, a state law uh, prohibiting guns in, in their you own? Know, I've not specifically polled our workers on, on that question, Senator. I think we, you know, we have a broader uh, safety culture conversation in terms of um, you know, how do we protect staff in terms of when they go out into the community, when we go into homes regarding a, a, a situation, you know, where we might be removing a child, we only do it with law enforcement present. So we do take a lot of steps and precautions, but specifically to your question, we've not polled our staff regarding S30. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, in that case, no. I might suggest when we, after our small hiatus on the bill, maybe we could hear from the SEA. Um, mm -hmm. because I know they have uh, expressed opinions on the subject in the past. Yeah. Um, Peggy, would um, I think it would be a good idea to keep a list of <clears throat> witnesses. I think we're going to take a two-week hiatus from counting this week, um, which, is an, which is only half a week, um, and not deal with S30 next week, giving people a chance to... <clears throat> gather some of their thoughts and then um, come back to it. Um, I don't have a calendar in front of me, just a week of whatever. Um, so we won't deal with it next week, but we probably should have the BSEA and other groups in. But I, um, other people who may be listening who are interested, please contact Peggy Delaney at pdelaney.stick. Um, pdelaney at leg.stick. S-T-A-T-E dot V-T dot U-S. And uh, we will try to accommodate um, folks planning to have uh, four different groups present themselves in a two hour period in order to give uh, more like a public hearing. Um, I know some other uh, individuals who asked the question. Um, anyhow, uh, Commissioner, um, are there other questions for the commissioner? I think it's pretty clear where the, where the, uh, where the you're concerned about how that would conflict with your own and, um, regulations now. Um, it's true of foster care too, right? That right, yes. Yeah. In, uh, in the home. Um, I mean, obviously in your foster home, you have knives, but they're not hunting knives or that's in the, uh, um, are there other questions of Commissioner Brown? Commissioner, we look forward to talking to you on Friday. Um, Peggy has posted a, uh, will be posting, um, and what she could do now is uh, something that was provided by Commissioner Brown regarding aggressive teams and how um, so I think it was a pretty good study. Was it not you? Did I get the right? Yeah, so uh, we commissioned the report um, using some of the federal funds for the Families First Prevention Services Act implementation to kind of do an assessment of our residential system of care and the youth that it's serving. Um, and so that's the report you're referencing that was just uh, issued uh, within the last like month, I believe. So if, if folks have a chance to read that report before Friday morning, you might find it helpful. There's a, a executive summary that's fairly easy to read and looking at some of the recommendations. And uh, they're not unlike the recommendations you're gonna hear in Justice Reinvestment too, in terms of having a robust behavioral health system in the community. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And Thank you Jennifer, for the nice time uh, this morning. Appreciate you joining us.
Yep, we'll see you on Friday, Senator. Okay. Yes. We'll see you this afternoon, Sean. Yes, see you this afternoon, Senator Benning. Looking forward to it. So, uh oh, thanks. what are you building for them? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we were before you on the policy aspects of the oh, yeah. um, secure residential treatment, and now institutions lo is looking at it, I think, from the point of view of the facilities and the investment in the lease that we're making um, in that, on that property in, in Newberry. Okay, good. Sounds good. Eric, could you join us for a moment while we have a let me have a few minutes to discuss um, where we're sure. at with S30. Um, we, we're in the midst of testimony, so it's hard to talk about where people are at. But um, to, I got an email from Karen Horn at VLCT, and they're very interested in having it cover um, town buildings. That's the Mont League of Cities and Towns, for those who are familiar with it. <coughs> Um, but when we do that, and our, our definition is really shaky, I think, of, uh, of government buildings. And um, <clears throat> if we were to go forward with the bill, I think we need to have it um, better define what a government building is, um, maybe using the federal definition. But further, if we do... If we do include more than just the campus here at um, oh here I'm, I'm in Benning. <laughs> the campus at in Montpelier uh, of state office buildings, I think we almost have to allow towns to decide what facilities they would want to cover, and there needs to be proper signage. I, does that make sense? Are you asking me or the committee members? Well, I'm asking the committee because right. the town may not want the salt shed to be an essential mm -hmm. building, whatever term we use. Well, if I can weigh in, Dick, I, at this point, having listened to the committee, having heard the testimony, um, I, I think only a very stripped down definition is... Uh, potentially going to get the votes to get out of committee. So um, I think eliminating property, parking lots, um, and then in terms of government buildings, I think if we, if we try to, I, I appreciate very much that the League of Cities and Towns were unanimous in their support when they voted, um, but it would, I, I think it would behoove us to cut it down to just something like um, city halls or town centers, wherever the government operations for the town are located, um, and and the capital complex. It's um, because if we if we try to get out into decentralized offices or government buildings, I think we'll just endlessly run into problems. I think you're probably right. But it, de it depends on there being support on the committee for government buildings in any in any form. Senator White. Perhaps um, a solution to the issue for the towns is to actually give them more flexibility in determining their own rules that instead of having to have Montpelier decide for them every single time they want to do something. That's just a plug for we the... Did. Huh? I was going to we, say, we did pass your pilot project. It never made it through the House, and there was opposition. There were eight people that voted against it. I do remember that. But um, we're going to try again this year. Yeah, but that's, that's – I don't think I want to do that in S30. Um, no, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. no. I'm just saying I, in I general. Was, I was suggesting giving the towns the ability to define opt-inning. Yeah to opt in or opt out, I don't care which term you use, in terms of uh, their government buildings. Um, I, I think, again, we'll, you know, we'll wind up, it's, it's a level of complexity that I think will sink, yeah. that will sink that 
piece. I honestly, in terms of government buildings, like the state house, the the you know the, the capital complex, and then um, as much as I appreciate the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, maybe it's too much to try to cover all of their uh, city halls. I, I I'm just trying to gauge the will of the committee. Um, I'm willing, of course, to go for that, but I don't know what others are. Well, um, we don't need to, I don't want to take a vote today. Um, I, I am concerned about, however, uh, the, what we heard from the commissioner about child care centers and uh, if, we're gonna, if it's going to create more of a problem for them than solve, solve a problem that they may not have. Senator Nathan. Well, I was just thinking the commissioner of BGS testified that all the state buildings are covered already in terms of you're not being able to bring a firearm. I know, but the, what happens when you do? There is no, the, the, the basic issue is, is it 3507? Have I got the, 3705. Well, I got the right numbers <laughs> in the wrong order. Um, that's where the, concern lies uh, for many of the advocates for the bill. Is that current law, you can say that you can't bring weapons in, but you can't enforce it. That's I think, the argument. You can tell somebody to leave and go put their weapon somewhere else. Uh, but if they insist, then you'd have to charge under that for illegal trespass. Right. Are we gonna have this conversation now? But we are. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, then, then I, I, I didn't. I thought that we were going to put off the committee discussion. Well, we are, but I was trying to get a sense for Eric so he isn't bored for the next two weeks with nothing. <laughs> oh, poor Eric. I bet, no, I bet he won't no be worries. bored. No worries. Senator Thanks. Benning, then Senator so, White. So I'm, the more I think about this, the more I don't like this bill. And let me say that, uh, Dick, with respect to your last statement, if an individual walks into a building with a gun and S-30 is passed as law, there will still have to be a confrontation of sorts between the individual and anyone attempting to remove them, which is precisely what's happening now with a sign out front that says no entry with a weapon. So we have heard from buildings and general services, the Capitol Police, the hospitals, and now the child care centers, every one of which has said, A, we have not had a problem. B, if there was a problem, we have the means to take care of that problem. So embarking on what is essentially an encroachment on a constitutional right, that leaves more confusion to me is very problematic. The bill is not necessary, so it violates my normal uh, thought process when dealing with anything because we don't have evidence that there's been a problem. We know that all these institutions have the ability to say, you can't come in here, leave. And if they refuse to do that, they run afoul of unlawful trespass and I am, also concerned that with respect to child care centers, now you're injecting another potential problem for them to have to deal with. I'll leave it at that. Uh, if Yes, go ahead. And that, uh, well, actually, I, could, I said Senator White could go next. So I um, I do want to uh, respond to what Joe said. Yeah, no, I know. You'll, uh, yeah. the, so I, I do too, I, actually. I have to say, I am not looking at this as a, a necessarily a constitutional issue about the right to bear arms, but I am looking at it as we're creating a new crime here. My, I thought our goal with justice reinvestment and everything else was to, to limit the number of crimes we create and the number of criminal records we create. And I've heard from people that, um, if we leave it the way it is, it has to be a two-step process and it's very complicated and hard to do. There, it, it would have to be a two-step process no matter what, because there has to be 
as Joe said, if somebody comes in with a gun, somebody has to confront that person. Somebody has to go and say, take that gun away. And then they're immediately charged. They're immediately a foul of the law. They have no ability to then leave or anything. And so um, a uh, state's attorney could, could charge them. They could. Um, so I, I actually don't see a need for this this new crime or this bill at all. The more testimony I hear, the more I say we, and I've been running it by a bunch of people in my area who are um, what you would call um, Wyndham County liberals. And when we talk about it, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. As, a port, as opposed to Northeast Kingdom conservatives? I, yeah. But, yeah. Well, well, well known there's no conservatives in Wyndham County. <laughs> I, I, I opposed a bill once um, and people said, oh, she's a female from Wyndham County. How could she oppose that bill? Anyway, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. And I've been running it by people here and to get their opinion on it. And when they understand that there is already a process for dealing with this, they're saying, why would we create a new crime? Can, so can, I think Philip would like to so say. Yep. It's, it's long past time for Eric to, to put the text of 3705 up on the screen because there's a piece of it that we've been ignoring that I, I really would like to talk about. So is there, is there a way, Peggy or Eric, for you to put the, the text up that, so that we can all look at it? <clears throat> Uh, Eric, do you have it? Yep. Okay. I, and you want to as, make, share, make me a co-host? Oh, yeah. Peggy? Sorry, yep. As, as okay. Eric is doing that, let me just set the stage. So what 3705 says is that if you go onto somebody else's property without permission or legal authority, then you run afoul of the law. Mm -hmm. That phrase, legal authority, I'm... I'm relatively sure that gun rights advocates would say that they have legal authority for mm -hmm. at least concealed carry, if not open carry. So when, when you see that, keep, keep this in mind. Okay, a person shall be imprisoned for not more than three months or fine not more than $500 or both if without legal authority or the consent of the person in lawful possession he enters or remains. Now, if somebody comes in with a concealed gun and says under the Sportsman's Bill of Rights and the Vermont Constitution and the US Constitution, I have three forms of legal authority for concealed carry. Now, I don't believe that the gun rights groups are going to agree that this obviates or takes away their right to concealed carry. And, and if, you think they are, we should have them all in again and have them answer that question. Because they will say, I'm sure, that they have a right to concealed carry anywhere unless there's a state law against it, like courthouses and schools. And Joe, you feel, I, I don't wanna speak I, to I'm just want, I, I need to comment on something that Joe said, and I wanna make clear. I think we heard plenty regarding hospitals and that there is a problem currently. And so I, I, just, I, I may agree with you on, the, on some of the other areas, Joe, that you mentioned, but I, I thought the testimony from Dr. Um, Slayton, was it? Yeah. And from uh, the hospital, so from the medical, the hospital association and the doc, the medical society were pretty clear that it, they feel threatened right now. Uh, they are concerned. So I, 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 don't, I don't think it would be a stretch to say that there is concern. Senator Benning. Dick, I have no um, quarrel with the concept that they feel threatened. What I meant by saying there's no evidence of a problem is that I have not heard anybody using a gun in a hospital setting other than the one incident at Dartmouth 
and that individual was clearly intending to commit murder, which just takes that incident out of all discussion here for relevance purposes, as far as I'm concerned. And I understand there may be others who disagree, but Eric, the words without legal authority, if I walk past a sign going into a grocery store that says, have to have shoes on, if you don't have shoes on, you're not allowed. If somebody confronts me at the door who owns the store and says, you cannot come in here, and they go in anyway, am I correct in assuming that they have lost their legal authority to walk in because they are now officially on notice against trespass? That's a complex question, and I, I wouldn't be able to give an answer to that off the top of my head. I do agree okay. that uh, um, the requirement of the notice communication by the owner that you mentioned is necessary for, for a trespass prosecution though. But, but the, those so uh, uh, I'm going to extend the same thing now to Matt Romei. When somebody has walked past a sign that says no weapons allowed and they are obviously carrying and Matt says, you cannot come in here. It seems to me that the Capitol Police have the ability to present that notice against trespass. And if the individual says, I can go in here because I've got uh, my constitutional rights, it seems that all legal authority for them to do so has been stripped once the owner or the, um, the person in charge of the building has given them instructions that they are entering in violation of the rules. Um, so I, I can understand, Philip, that they might try to make that argument, but the bottom line is the police have authority, the sergeant at arms has authority to eject the person from the building, as but, does in the case of NVRH, Sheriff Bobby Clark can boot somebody from the building who's violating the sign there. But so Joe, I understand they might try to make the argument, but I think they're going to lose that argument. Okay, your, your analogy isn't good, though. Um, you don't have a constitutional right to go into a restaurant without shoes. You do have a constitutional right to bear arms and you have been a defender of that right. So hang on. So what I'm saying is that this phrase without legal authority in almost every case would make for a simple confrontation. It's not a simple confrontation as we've seen time and time again in the last few years, we, we have a very radicalized open carry movement nationwide. And what often people are trying to do is make a point and prove a test case about their ability under the constitution and the state constitution to carry a firearm. So I'm saying that when Vermont traditions and other groups come in and point to this particular statute as though it were cut and dried, that any place could put up a sign and trespass people off their property with firearms, I don't believe it's that easy at all. But Mr. Chair, if I might, I had Eric draft a piece of language. Um, it's just one sentence. Uh, would I have your permission to have him show us that? If we can. Uh, Eric, we're gonna, you can. We're gonna go for four more minutes. So this, so people know okay. that we need to break a quarter of. Eric, do you have that piece of language? I don't have that up, no. I, I have it, um, if, if uh, you can share uh, my screen. Um, um, you would have you. to. Um, can we do that? I, I can make you the co-host and you would have to share your screen. I couldn't share. Okay. I can't share your screen. I will try my best. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll see how technically proficient Senator Baruth is. Okay. <laughs> Eric, you probably need to stop sharing your screen. Okay. Do I do that from here? Okay. Can yeah. you guys see uh, that? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Good yes. job, Senator Baruth. I'm impressed. Okay. So you'll see number three has been added. So this is, this is making manifest what Joe and the Vermont Traditions and other groups have been saying that the statute does Anyway, it shall be a trespass, trespass in violation of this subsection if a person enters or remains on any land or in any place while 
carrying a firearm and signs or placards prohibiting the possession of firearms so designed and situated to give reasonable notice are posted on the land or in the place. Now, all that does is make explicit what others have been saying is implicit in this statute. I would be all for adding this to the trespass statute. And I think that would deal with a lot of our problems. Okay. That's a helpful to know that would this be an amendment to the bill or would it be the bill? Uh, well, I mean, it's the will of the committee. So yeah. I would hope that we could save some piece of S30, but I would join it to this because it, it seems like there's a consensus on the gun rights side that the trespass statute is the preferable mode. This would just clarify what they've been saying it already does. Right. So I will, I will email this to the committee okay. and people can take a closer look at it. But, uh, but I, I think it does nothing other than, oh, the one other thing it does that Eric uh, made sure of is there would be no need here to confront the person with the weapon as long as the placards or signs were situated as to give reasonable notice. So you wouldn't have to have an employee at the hospital go up to an armed person. The security guard or the police could immediately ask them to take the firearm out. But you're creating a strict liability criminal offense. That's basically what this does. Well, you're you're saying that I, it's I, already I, there. I need to. Yeah. yeah. I think we need to move on because we're going to take a break now, and you're back at ten o'clock for the public for the uh, hearing with the other two committees. And I think you have to re uh, <clears throat> resume in. Is that correct, Peggy? Uh, yes. Yes. Can you stop sharing your screen, Senator Berth, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes, you guys can, I'm going to end the live stream. I'm going to start a new one, but you guys can just all.